we have uh, nine bills on the agenda, one of which, at the patron's request, we are going to take five for the day. That is uh, House Bill 1498. Patron has requested that bill go by without objection. Bill is by for the day. I have a sign up sheet as much as possible. We will take folks in the order that they signed up. I understand that there are lots of other commitments and obligations and people will be coming and going. I promise you we will get to you when I see you in the room as quickly as we can. We miss you going down the list. Uh, I don't know how much debate we'll have on these bills this morning, but in advance of that, just let me say that we're going to try to limit individual speakers to two to three minutes each um, unless we get into a position where that's not possible. But for the most part, that should give you sufficient time to express your views and allow us to move uh, with expedience through this. I'm Delegate uh, Dickey Bell, uh, Chair of this subcommittee. I'm going to dispense with introductions. Uh, this committee has not changed in name or face except for the loss of uh, now Senator McClellan, uh, who we will miss, frankly. Uh, her seat remains vacant in the House. And uh, so does her seat on the subcommittee until the powers that be decide what to do about that. That's way above my favor. So having said all that, um, first on my list is uh, Delegate Head with uh, House Bill 1437. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, bringing this bill, this was uh, an issue that was brought to me by a constituent whose daughter uh, has uh, a pretty profound sight impairment, and I think you've got a letter that he wrote back to the uh, to, to the nurse at, uh, at, at his daughter's school, in case from middle school. But when the mandatory uh, testing for vision came through, uh, this is a child that already is on an IEP, uh, uh, yeah, an IEP for vision, and yet they put her through the standard vision screening, which of course she's going to fail, and then gave her the note to take home that said, you failed a test. And she was fairly traumatized by that, um, just that she had felt like she had done something wrong, didn't understand that she had failed the test. And the, the ridiculousness of it was that the school knew she was going to fail the test. There's no way that she could possibly pass the test. That's why she's under an IEP. And so uh, we put this bill together to say if you're under an IEP for uh, vision or hearing when those tests occur, you can be exempted from that because the excuse back from the school was that this is just, we're just following the rules that we have to do this for everybody. So this would just give an exemption for that. Very simple. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from the subcommittee? Hearing none, anyone in the audience wish to speak to this bill, either for or against? Mr. Chairman, um, the VA supports this legislation. Uh, quite frankly, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> Anyone else wish to speak to the bill? Hearing and seeing none, uh, so I have a motion properly seconded to recommend reporting the bill. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, uh, please raise your right hand. Opposed, same sign. Bill reports. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Delegate Dudenhefer, you have uh, House Bill 1690 and 1757. Mr. Chairman, Whatever order you, uh, I'm working on some language change on my uh, Bill 1690 with uh, VEA, and um, I'm not prepared really to talk to that right now. But it just came up, so can I have this one deferred until your next subcommittee meeting? Uh, yeah, we can do that. Could I have a motion to take the bill by for the day? Moved and seconded. That bill will go by until next week. Uh, while we're on that topic, let me just tell you, it's a already know. Uh, it's a short session. We only have three meetings scheduled. Um, and we may be forced, because of the line of work, to schedule a special. I'd like to not do that because I don't know where we can fit it in. Um, 
So I'm happy. I know that these, these bills came up to you in a hurry. And I know that some of them need tweaking. I get all that. We'll do the best we can to accommodate you and take them by. But just so you understand, uh, we may be looking at some very busy meetings. I understand. Thank you. Um, the other bill I have is um, 1757. There's two amendments to that bill. are meant to bring uh, my bill more in line with uh, what the uh, Department of Ed is, is recommending in this area. Um, uh, minutes removed, seconded, all in favor, seconded, minutes will say aye. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's, it's come to my attention over mostly just last year with more detail, but over a number of years, uh, the plight uh, we're having in our public schools with the lack of having trained medical staff in the school. As our requirements have tightened over the years that a student can't even take an over-the-counter drug without supervision or a school nurse, only about half of our schools actually have school nurses. It's, um, it's a situation where in some school districts they share one nurse per multiple schools um, and there have been numbers of, uh, there have been lawsuits, complaints, I mean there, there are a number of different situations I think we're, uh, we're heading for some real disaster when it comes to that. In addition to just the regular nursing duties, there are certain requirements that even a trained nurse aren't, required, aren't allowed to uh, perform in the schools and the administrative burden on a registered nurse who has a full-time job just, as, just doing her job as a nurse uh, can be almost a full-time job also. So what I'm, I'm recommending here, and we, we've uh, had numbers of meetings, but um, while we recommend that there be a nurse in every school, this bill identifies it as part of the SOQ and requires that a nurse be, um, be available in every school. It also um, talks about a ratio of one nurse per 550 students. Um, I understand that there'll be probably some uh, discussion about you know additional costs associated with this. Um, I think sometimes we get to a point where uh, we need to look at the, the safety of the students. I have a personal situation that affects me that I guess got me looking at this a little harder and that I have an 11 year old granddaughter who has an acute emphasize the word acute, uh, peanut allergy where without access to an EpiPen, if she has an episode, she'll probably not survive. Um, and the thought of having uh, an untrained medical professional identifying what her situation is and then administering the EpiPen, uh, to me, I find to be a, a life or death type situation. So I think it's something that we really need to, um, we need to address. I think the bill goes a long way to doing that. Um, for full implementation on what I'm asking, I have a, a budget amendment uh, up in appropriations for about $1.8 million. Um, but I think that actually the bill can be passed and you know, to get ready to add this requirement to the SOQ so that in the future we will move toward um, requiring every school to have a school nurse, a trained school nurse there. There's another argument against that I've been hearing, and I'll throw that out right now, and that is that there are not enough nurses to go around. In many areas, they can't pay enough or hire enough nurses to do that. Well, I, I honestly think that that's another problem. That's not a problem associated with what I'm trying to correct here. So I have a number of um, nurses and people that I've met with, several students, and I think uh, I have the support of some of the uh, associations that are out there, too. So um, I'm asking that you um, recommend uh, House Bill 757. Thank you, Kelly. You uh, just for just to be clear, when we talk about school nurses, are we talking about registered nurses or are there other <coughs> I'm, I'm specifically talking about registered nurses, but I, you know, at this point, I, it, I I'm not an expert. Maybe if I could get some people that could, could address that specifically as to what it what skill set exactly
exactly is required or whether it takes a full registered nurse or an LPN. Is that what you're saying? It's okay with you to bring in. Yeah, I think we should probably uh, try to be clear on that. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. Thank you, Bowers. I'm here with the Virginia Association of School Nurses. Our National Association, National Association of School Nurses, and we support a registered nurse in every school. Right now, it is not defined in the code, and um, we believe that things go incrementally. The registered nurse is the one who is specifically educated and trained and has the authority to uh, assess and um, plan and evaluate and implement things that no other kind of healthcare provider can do, nurse and class. Um, and so we would prefer that it be a registered nurse. It does not need to be in the language of this bill. We're also grateful that Delegate Dudenheffer has changed the language. We didn't know about that when we were talking about it last night, but the standards of quality revisions that were proposed by the Board of Education for this year were that there be a one school nurse per 550 students and that the fiscal impact of such a proposal was similar to what Dr. Uh, Delegate Dudenheffer has uh, put in his budget amendment. We haven't seen a fiscal impact statement and that was being developed on the basis of the original language. Delegate Cole. A question. I, I want to understand exactly what the legislation <coughs> does. Does it add a, you know, uh, a school nurse or increase the, the school nurse to the standards of quality so that this would be a state-funded state position? It does. We've had uh, recommendations in the past and we haven't moved much forward to uh, accommodate what is required under the medical uh, standards that are that are out there, and uh, yes, we believe that it requires an SOP change. Okay, just, just to follow up, so this would add a position or positions to the standards of quality, which would then, you know, at least be partially funded by the state, correct? Yes. Uh, that was the the Board of, uh, Delegate Cole, the Board of uh, Education had recommended that the school nurses be added to the standards of quality along with school uh, changes in ratios for school counselors and additionally school social workers and school psychologists. There is no bill coming forward to that effect. So right now, school nurses are included in support personnel under the standards of quality. Oh, right. So this does not I, change I'm that I'm confused much. then of what the legislation actually does. All right. Uh, are we just passing, is it passing this bill, are we just passing an unfunded mandate on local school districts? I have a, uh, I have a budget wedge up in appropriations for $1.8 million, but I think the bill can actually be passed without the funding added to it that we know that we're going to go forward requiring nurses in every, um, in every school. Again, it's a very technical area, so if I could maybe get the Department of Ed to Good morning, Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Cindy Kane. I'm Assistant Superintendent for Policy and Communications for the Department of Education. And what the Board of Education, right now, nurses are included in the support services category. And that category is funded through the SOQ, but the decision on how many of these positions to employ is left to the local school division. And they include school psychologists, school social workers. School nurses are pulled out if that money is provided based on practice, estimated prevailing practice. However, there's no separate ratio for school nurses now in the standards of quality. So what this bill does, it would say that, that the SFQ would fund at a, at a ratio of one per 550 or one um, per school program. So there, it, there is a, a fiscal impact. It would have to be compared with um, what is being provided now under the support service category. And the fact that school nurses are pulled out, there is a separate funding uh, funding mechanism for school nurses. And I, and I apologize, this thing has been changing kind of on the fly and trying to keep track of every little aspect has been difficult with all the other bills I have, so. No, no, no. Just so I'm clear, the standards of quality figure that was in the 
the State Board's report in December recommended a ratio of 550, one nurse to 550. The bill is one nurse to 1,000. No, the amendment changed that. I don't see how the amendment struck the word 1,000 in line 114. No, I'm sorry, I'm not reading Okay, so now, now as amended, the bill complies on the conforms to the yeah, standard of quality recommendation from the state board. Yeah. Dr. Gage, back me up here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna crash and burn here. The, the addition to the bill was the minimum of one per, per school. We have schools that don't, that we have a, you know, share a nurse or don't have a nurse, don't see a nurse. They have maybe an assistant principal or someone who is actually uh, administering drugs. Other questions from subcommittee members? Mr. Chairman? Dr. Rob. Question for the patron. Uh, I, I certainly uh, agree with the principal. a bill amending the statute on the administration of that depends so that individuals, so each school division has to uh, train a number of individuals in the administration of epinephrine in the event that they suspect an anaphylactic reaction. So it's not just the school nurse, but there are other people who are trained in the schools to do that. And the epinephrine uh, injector, the auto injector, must be available in the event of emergency. So I'm not sure I answered that totally, but that currently exists in the and, and I use that specifically because I have, a, you know, I have a personal knowledge of the, the situation. I think there are a number of people who are going to speak behind me that can address their personal experience with how this, this has been applied and the deficiencies that are there. Other questions for the subcommittee? Anyone in the audience wish to speak in favor of the bill? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Jim Council representing Prince William Schools. This is an initiative of ours uh, to go, uh, Mr. Chairman, to Delegate Cole's question. I see all my drinking buddies lined up over here to speak against me this morning. And I can tell you that uh, one of their major concerns would be the impact financially at the local level because there is a cost there. But response to that, I will tell you that this is an issue that I think the legislature is just going to have to get its arms around. Uh, if I just give you the brief history and you look at the health care responsibilities that have been added to school divisions, we can go back to concussions, we can go back to CPR, EpiPens, you can look at this session, the number of bills that relate to nurses and in the absence of nurses, so-called trained non-nurse personnel rendering serious health care services to our students. And if we're going to continue to load these kinds of responsibilities, not only on our school nurses, but as I said, non-nurse personnel, we're going to really have to get our grips around this. And it may cost money, but I think it's an essential that the legislature take a close look at it. Mr. Chairman, to go to Delegate Barak's question, uh, as Dr. Cade mentioned, you know, nurses under the SOQs are in a category, and the locality has some discretion as to where, uh, how they will fill those positions. I just assume not name them, but I can tell you there was a county that went over a year without a single nurse in the school division. So it is serious. Uh, I think nurses need to be singled out, that needs to be a requirement, and it needs to be adequately funded. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Council. And with respect to your opposition this morning, welcome to my world. 
Mr. Chairman, I share your pain, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, would this be an appropriate time to ask a question? No, that we're on. Yes. Uh, okay. So we understand the, the gap that, that there's there's demonstrated uh, gaps here in the, in the coverage. Um, can you expand on that to tell us what need presented itself in some of those circumstances? You, you mean in, a, in, a, in an actual health care crisis? If, if that's I mean, I don't, I don't think I have any more stories at hand here this morning. No, I'm sorry, I don't. Okay. But, you can okay.
provided some training to the non-medical staff who are in the schools. And we've been able to access the records. However, gaining the support has taken numerous meetings and two Office of Civil Rights complaints with the Department of Education. While we have eroded their resistance to providing accommodations to our daughters, we are now reaching challenges on resources to provide the care they need. Your support for House Bill 1757 will help us remove this next hurdle we are facing. First, with health aides, while the health aides that are in the school, they are trained to support many students by distributing the medications and supporting diabetes tasks like checking blood glucose. However, complex diseases like that diabetes is dynamic and proper care requires proper education. To adjust for the change in insulin potency due to greater or lesser levels of activity. So nurses provide the education and the knowledge that the current people in the health setting can't provide. Second, we have seen firsthand resistance of the health department to provide care even when the school finally agrees that it's best interest of the student to access education. Amending the statute to remove that option of health departments providing care, putting the requirement in the SQ places more control in the hands of the schools and allows them to provide faith under federal law, who are the targets of lawsuits and office of civil rights complaints. Under the current statute, health departments can deny care and access to school to students and leave the school district holding the bag for liability without the means to ever fix the problem. Third, the SOQ Ma standard. I'm going to ask you to begin to wrap up. Okay. We have other people who wish to speak, and we have a lot of work to do. The current statute makes staffing of nurses appear optional, while art teachers, librarians, language teachers, and others are required. As you've heard in our testimony, the nurse can be a critical link to a child with a disability receiving education. They are just as critical as direct education support, like administrators and their ratios should not be negotiated. Um, currently, um, there's a, in, currently in the code is a recommendation for nurses. In 1995, we put a recommendation, the House did, to request by 1995 to 1999 to increase the student nurse ratio from one nurse to 1,000 students. Fairfax has ignored that recommendation in the code for the last 18 years. They have funded other, and we have a list of other fundings that they put towards less important issues that have kept the money away from the school nurses and away from my daughter. And if the nurses were in the school, they could advocate for the kids and ensure the girls had the right access and the right health care in the schools, which is what they've been not receiving because the schools are not present. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, again, uh, members of the subcommittee. The VEA is in support of this legislation I want to take this opportunity for the uh, close collaboration with the Virginia Department of Education as well as with Delegate Didenhepper. Uh, we had some original concerns with the number of 1,000, one nurse per 1,000 students in his original um, uh, wording, but uh, we have since been able to work with him on changing that. I, I think to go to the bottom line, if you will, and this may seem as an oversimplification, but it is a reality. In the absence of a school nurse, ultimately, it is a classroom teacher who has to bear the responsibility of making sure that the health needs of our students are met. We can talk about support positions versus non-support positions. We can talk about the cost. We can talk about all of those things. When those types of positions are eliminated or are not provided, ultimately, everything gets pushed down to a classroom teacher. And I appreciate the comments by Mr. Council with regard to how many more things are we going to continue to layer upon layer upon layer upon layer um, to our teachers. So the VA is in full support of this legislation. Thank you. to delegate to unlicensed 
unregulated lay people to provide care that quite frankly <coughs> was not ethical and it was not in the best interest of the children. Because assessment is key and we cannot delegate assessment. Um, I have tried very hard to get this legislation and Delegate Duden Heffer was kind enough, he's my representative to do this. I stepped away from school nursing in the state of Virginia. I now provide that care to these children at home. And that's key too to understanding. These children are not taken care of only by their parents at home. They have nursing care at home. When they go to school, they are in loco parentis. They should be getting the same care that they are getting in their home that I provide as an RN to them. I stepped away and I'm a national certified school nurse. I've taken it to the next level. I'm an RN, I started an emergency room. I trained for six to eight weeks to function in an emergency with a team of doctors and other nurses. You're asking lay people to manage a healthcare crisis alone for the 15 or more minutes it takes for EMS to get there. I find that unacceptable and I hope that I can eventually go back to work as a school nurse a national certified school nurse in the state of Virginia. And I'd be glad to answer any questions. I've provided you all with your constituent signatures and their statements from the petitions that I've done. You've gotten direct communications from doctors, teachers, parents, nurses, and others who support this legislation. If you have any questions about the legality, I've provided all of that information. You can look it up under schoolnurseadvocate at gmail.com. It is in your box. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman and members of the board. Um, thank you for having me today. My name is I'm Jennifer Natipa, and I'm here as a mother of a child with type 1 diabetes. <clears throat> My daughter Annika is 13 years old now, and she was diagnosed with type 1 at the age of 7. She's going to the bathroom all the time and drinking all the time and had lost a concerning amount of weight. <clears throat> we really didn't know what to expect when we brought her to the hospital, even though I'm a registered nurse myself. Um, when, upon the diagnosis, which was devastating, um, our biggest concern was how are we going to get her back to school um, with blood sugar monitoring and counting all of her food and carefully weighing that with an injection of insulin. Um, that was our biggest concern and I remember crying and asking the doctor that in the hospital. Um, my daughter, um, upon learning from her fellow type 1, type one pe peers, um, and always a concern of the parents is the terrifying thought that she might suffer from severe hypoglycemia and become unconscious and require an emergency injection called glucagon. That's similar to an EpiPen for a child with type 1 diabetes. My child learning from her peers, she said, Mom, I don't want to fall asleep and never wake up. Um, I'm happy to say that we've weathered, we've weathered that very, very rough storm, and life is not easier, and she is well-managed and healthy. Um, all of this would not have been, hap hap been possible without the role of a school nurse. <clears throat> She's always handled the things that she needs and, um, and um, helped me to maintain my job full-time as a school nurse. <clears throat> my daughter's a little older in middle school now, but I have a school of 600 students, and I service a preschool and a Head Start kindergarten through fifth grade. I service one to 600 students, and it's a really good number. Um, I did service a high school for a time, one to three to four thousand, and it was not a reasonable request of a nurse. Um, my role as a community health nurse is to provide wellness for the entire community. I provide screening for immunization, hearing, vision for students. I'm a resource and supervision for sometimes daily care for our most fragile students. Uh, chronic illnesses such as asthma, severe allergies such as peanut allergies, adrenal insufficiency, cerebral palsy, hemophilia, spina bifida, Crohn's disease, and sickle cell disease are just to name a few. Skilled nursing duties are only are are only a health only a health professional should be tasked with, such as insulin shots um, and calculations, administering medications, monitoring insulin pumps. The list goes on and on. Um, I, I I've heard some amazing testimony, but I just wanted to thank you all for considering this bill HB one seven five seven, and please consider um, please consider passing it. Thank you so much. Do you have any questions of me as a full-time nurse working in Virginia currently? Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone?
anyone in opposition to the bill would not want to be you. <laughs> Chairman Thompson, Superintendent's Association. I understand. Uh, but I was a superintendent for a long time. And there are times when uh, you all pass things <clears throat> that would come down to my office and I would say, with no money, and, and ask me to do things that I didn't have staff for and that there weren't staff to hire. And I would say, how am I supposed to do this? <clears throat> and while this may be a very doable thing in Prince William County or in even the, uh, the paper in Stafford, it's going to be extremely hard to implement something like this in Southwest or in the South Side when there is a shortage of nurses, period, as well as a shortage of money. Now, if, uh, if I'm asked to do this as a superintendent without the adequate state funding or without uh, positions that uh, I can fill, one of the things I'm going to have to do is say, what do I do? Do I fund this teacher position? Do I fund the school nurse position? What do I do? Where do I take the money from? And if I do not have nurses uh, available, and, I, and while the uh, patron may feel that's a separate issue, when you pass something and put it in the SOQ, I'm supposed to go do it as a superintendent. And, I'm supposed, and I typically don't get a lot of lead time. So I, how am I going to fulfill that requirement of one per building when, I, when the hospital can't fill its own requirements for nursing. So there are some very definite concerns. I don't argue the importance of school nurses. I had them as a superintendent, and I think they play a good function. But there are difficulties with implementation when we don't consider availability of staff and funding. And for that reason, we are opposed to this bill. No, the money. That's a question. The question for the speaker. Just so I'm yes. clear, the, so the state board has recommended a ratio of one to five fifty. Right. You saying school divisions are required to comply with that in any event, even without this legislation? No, that's the, that's a recommendation on the state board. board to the general assembly. Okay. And I think as Kay pointed out, that they have some aspirational issues. Uh, I will note that that recommendation almost also went to the governor, and I did not see it. I could have missed it. Included in his budget. School board's association. I don't stand in opposition. I just stand to express a couple of concerns. I not oppose a, a measure like this put in by Mr. Duden Heffer, who is a friend. And I know that the overall objective of this legislation is, is good. The concern, I, I have two concerns. Uh, the first concern is that if this goes into the SOQ, that the actual uh, funding per position has got to reflect the market rate that you have to pay to get an RN. I think that Delegate you know, Cole asked whether this is an RN and an LPN or, or a nurse assistant. Um, as you know, in a lot of nursing homes and other facilities in your areas, uh, they can't staff with solely with RNs. They use LPNs and CNAs uh, to do a lot of their a lot of their uh, nursing duties. So I think it has to be fairly funded, fairly funded. And secondly, a lot of your areas, there is a huge demand that cannot be met by the health care providers in your areas for RNs. I don't know whether you've seen the ads. Uh, maybe in the, in the more urban areas, you don't find this to be the case, but I will tell you in the rural areas, the hospitals are just absolutely uh, <coughs> the bush to try to get RNs. We would be competing uh, with those folks. So these are a couple of concerns. If you do it, if you pass the legislation, we're going to have to do the best we can. I'm just telling you that this is, this is not where we have people beating down the, 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 the doors to, to, uh, to seek employment. These are folks that are highly sought after and can get employment in any number of uh, uh, situations. So those are just concerns that I have that I would ask that you take into consideration. Thank you. Dr. Lamani, do you have a question? Maybe for Dr. Cave, I'm just I'm looking at the state board's report. And I notice um, uh, there's the recommendation of one to five fifty. It goes on to, to mention, I guess, a, a U.S. Department of Health and Human Services recommended ratio of one nurse for seven fifty students. 
Uh, and it also s seems to say, I'm going to read it, the recommended ratio is lower than the estimated ratio of one school nurse per 600 students as currently provided by local school divisions. I'm assuming that's local school divisions in Virginia. The, can you give us any sense of why the state board picked 550? I think we've heard some compelling personal testimony here, but is there some analysis that's been done statewide to say that that's the right number and why some other number isn't preferred? The, um, as, that's an estimate of one for 660 in terms of that would be statewide. So that is not for every um, individual school division. So as you're looking at the recommendations, you're seeing more funding now. The board is trying to find a balance between understanding and recognizing problems and the need for resources in this area, yet a balanced approach to try to, to look at the, um, the fiscal impact. So the, the 550 is not as much as what the national recommendations might be, and not as much as, um, as 1,000, but it is reflective and close to the an estimate of what is happening in Virginia now. And the, I think the message of this recommendation is to recognize the need for um, staffing, nurses, and those services in the school divisions and acknowledging that that's a position that should be considered uh, separately as opposed to within a whole um, category of support services. Thank you. Sure. Just real quick, I didn't know I was so popular. I think it uh, has to do with my future endeavors. And now everyone wants to be my friend. Considering over time they've stood up against me, I, uh, I, I'm not sure I was schools usually don't go too far over 550. But let's say you have a high school size age, 1,800 students or something like that. Um, so in that high school, how many, 1,800 students, how many um, nurses would we expect to see working in that school? The recommendation would be on a division-wide basis that you have um, one for 550 kids. And from the board, the board's recommendation. The board did not say um, a nurse in every school. Um, that was not part of the recommendation. Okay, I'm sorry. So let's, let me use another example. You have three elementary schools, one with 600 students, right. one with 900 students, right. one with 550 students. In actuality, you would have an, a nurse, one nurse in each of those schools. You would not have to have a nurse in each of the schools. You would have to have at least one nurse for every 550 students. Yeah, I guess I'm saying it different. Oh, I'm sorry. So that's, that ends up being five, it's the one every 550. But they don't have to be in the school. Yeah, but you wouldn't, I, I wouldn't imagine you would do, I, I use a 900 because I wouldn't imagine you would put two in, the nine, in, 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 one, in one of those 900 and then leave one empty and one with one. And that's the discretion uh, school boards have now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and it has to do with the distribution. Doug Cole. Yeah. Uh, you know, since this has a, a significant fiscal impact, you know it's going to have to go upstairs. Uh, and I, I assume the way it's written right now, if it were to pass, it would be effective one July. Uh, and as you know, Local governments are already preparing their budgets, uh, so I was wondering, uh, you know, and I'm trying to help it out, uh, if you would be uh, okay with a delayed effective date uh, to make it not effective this July, but next July. It might also help it to get out of uh, upstairs appropriations as well. And, and we've considered that, and I would be open to that. Okay. 
Mr. Chairman, I would vote. I would make a motion to amend it to include a delay the effective date of uh, 1 July 2018. We have uh, a motion to amend the bill with a uh, with an enactment date of July 1st, 2018. Uh, is there a second? Moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Don't get the money. And folks, we really need to pick up the pace here. I'm going to move the report to the bill as amended. So, moved and seconded to report the bill as amended. I think that's what he meant. Uh, substitute motion to report and refer the, the bill to appropriations. Um, is there a second to that? Second. Hearing no discussion or complaints, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is Delegate Greeson still with us? Okay. Delegate Freitas. We still have five bills to go, folks, and uh, we, we really need to pick up the pace. If there are people in the audience who are going to speak to these bills, I'm going to have to ask you to hold your testimony to a reasonable few minutes. We just don't have time for uh, extended debate on every issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, House Bill 1770, essentially all it does is it provides uh, local school boards and superintendents with some more authority in order to waive some of the uh, additional requirements necessary to get more career technical educators into the classroom. Um, the reason why this is important is because obviously in some of these rural areas where we don't have a surplus of people with industry recognized certifications, we're running into this either or proposition. So we're not saying that these other requirements um, within the uh, governing licensure we teach, we're not saying they're not important, we're not saying that they're, they're not necessary in some way, we're just saying that again, we should be allowed, we should be allowing local superintendents, school boards to be able to make those uh, important decisions so we don't run into issues where now all of a sudden we can't give our kids access to career technical education classes because they haven't gone through some sort of uh, you know, training with respect to um, maybe dyslexia awareness. Again, it's not that that's not important, it's just we don't want that to make, we don't want something like that to, to be the difference between getting the course and not getting the course. So all this would do was, if you uh, draw your attention on line 88, uh, each local school board or division superintendent may waive for any teacher seeking initial licensure or renewal of a license with an endorsement in the area of career and technical education, any applicable requirements set forth in subsection C, subdivisions 1 through 6, and subdivision 8. The one that we left in there as mandatory is obviously the industry recognized certification because if you're going to be providing career technical education, and that, that should be a requirement. But as far as the others, we just want to give a little bit of latitude to localities so they can make those decisions. Thank you, Delegate Briggs. Questions for the patron? Delegate Hester. Uh, my, one question. Um, in waiving the requirement, does it mean that they, the uh, new hire, would not have to go back and complete these requirements at some time in the licensure process? They, they were so as long as they, as long as they had the industry recognized certification, they could waive it at the local level. Um, again, but the, I'm letting them make that determination. But we're not going to require them to to go through you know a particular licensure or, or an additional requirement. So I guess the answer would be yes. Other questions for the patron? Anyone in the audience wish to speak to the bill? Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, David Bailey. Speaking on behalf of the Virginia Association for Career and Technical Education, we appreciate the, the work that the patrons done. We've been meeting with him, talking with him. Not here in support or opposition. We do have some heartburn about the CTE teachers being sort of a separate class of teachers sitting through the hour discussion on nurses. I even wonder about that first aid part and all of that that's being deleted. I, I offer trying to be solid, and I offer to both my client and to the patron that perhaps on line 89 you could remove the part or renewal of a license that might get to what I think I was hearing one member of your subcommittee possibly addressing. But neither patron nor my client liked my proposal, so I stepped back out of that. So I get that a lot. 
Yes. So we, we are interested we are interested in career and technical ed being provided in all the schools. And that's why we certainly are not opposed to the bill. Thank you. I'm Smith Superintendent Association. We're in uh, support of the bill for the flexibility for basketball. Good morning, Cindy Kay, the Department of Education. And uh, as I just told the delegate, there are just a few considerations we would like to um, share with the subcommittee. Within that section of the code for licensure requirements for teachers, um, there are requirements for child abuse recognition and also for CPR and AED and health. And so, so uh, while we totally appreciate the need for CT teachers, and local school boards wanting to be able to hire folks that they know and that they wish without having them go through a, a lot of unnecessary training that would not be directly related to what the work they're going to do. Um, there are a few parts of those licensure requirements that are um, important and in, in that part of that section. Just wanted to let you know that. Just quickly, Mr. Chairman, the Middle High School principals and we support the flex bill for this bill. Thank you. Good morning again, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. The VA appreciates the difficulty in finding uh, qualified CTP teachers. That is not a new phenomenon. Unfortunately, the issue is spreading beyond CTE. VDOE reports we have 800 unfilled teaching positions in the Commonwealth. Now, some would say that making licensure much easier is, is a simple fix. Well, the reality is there's nothing about public education that's simple. And it shouldn't be, because we're talking about the best interest of children. We do not believe that loosening or lessening requirements for teacher certification is the answer to the problem. It is nothing more than a band-aid. It is a short-term fix. We are going to have to address the long-term issue of teacher shortage, not just in CTE, but also in many other areas. The number one shortage of teachers in the Commonwealth today, elementary classroom teachers. We do not believe that this is going to solve the problem long-term. And until we start looking at long-term solutions, we are going to be back here year after year after year after year talking about the same things over and over and over again, as opposed to this legislation of all due respect. Very wise confederation of teachers. Yeah, I'll we'll have to echo um, Jim Livingston's uh, sentiments this year in Fairfax. We started off with 250 vacancies, and as of today, well, last Thursday, we had 136 still on full positions with a uh, um, certified. Well, these aren't regular positions either with the usual problem of hard to fill positions, uh, STEM, etc. These are K through four positions. I'd also like to say that, as, uh, as Dr. K pointed out, that um, there are some things that are important for all educators to know. And I would just hope that somehow with the Department of Ed and, the, and uh, with the intention of the bill that they can come together and have some sort of agreement on what those are. For example, I'll keep those certified in CPR and EpiPen, there are certainly a um, vast number of other um, critical needs for um, teachers to know uh, about their student population. So thank you very much. Delegate Freitas, last word? Sure, I, I would just say, yeah, speaking of a couple points, again, but we're not we're not saying that certain these requirements are not important, but to specifically with the child abuse awareness, I think it's also important to note that a child is generally going through you know, five, six classes a day. So you have multiple teachers that have been trained in this. And a teacher is not going to recognize abuse one way or the other if the class doesn't exist. So if, if we get into these either-or propositions, the question is, are we going to trust our localities to be able to determine whether or not they think someone is worthy of being in the classroom or not? I'm just more comfortable leaving that decision at the local level at this point, especially when, again, 
some of these rural areas, it, it's, it's, a, it's a real problem. So again, I, I acknowledge the concerns, but I, I do think we need to give this additional leverage to localities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee operates on motion. Move to report. Moved and seconded to report the bill. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, signify by raising your right hand. Opposed, same side. Other bills report. Delegate Tillerson.
discussion on the motion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Fine. Did you get that? Hopefully, council can. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Just trying to work some things down here. Um, so, uh, looking at the substitute um, line 48, uh, after parent of we struck an alleged victim of bullying um, and then inserted any student involved in an alleged bullying incident and then keep the rest the same. Um, I would present that to Delegate Cole as, as an option. <coughs> Delegate Fillerborn, I, I don't think this amendment damages the integrity of your bill. I, I think it is just another uh, area that probably okay. needs to be addressed. Uh, if you okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Delegate Cole. Thank you. Okay. We've uh, approved the amendment, but we've moved it to say that it voted on it. So let's hear from your, your folks. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. My name is Sylvia Farstein. I'm the mother of 17-year-old Brandon Farstein, a junior in Henrico County Public School. Brandon um, was celebrating Thanksgiving with us when he was tagged in several Instagram posts and to his horror and shock, it turned out that somebody created fake Instagram accounts using his images and had the most vile, derogatory, anti-Semitic language in it. In addition to that, it had video of Brandon on his mobility device in the hallways of his high school. So very clearly, it involved high school students. These accounts were followed by over 100 uh, followers on Instagram, and we realized that most of them were students of the high school. Um, when Brandon went uh, to school that Monday following Thanksgiving and reported this to administration, there was nothing proactive that was done for us. Um, we were dealing with the emotional anguish of it all, and my son not feeling safe at his own high school, and I, as the parent, was put in a position to spearhead all communication. I had to send emails out to the administration. I had to set up a meeting with the principal. And there was nothing that made us feel like the school was proactively and seriously following up on this incident. And I feel that it truly is unacceptable for a high school student to be cyberbullied and not have a procedure in place to protect not only the victim, um, but to have proactive communication with the family as well. Good morning, Mr. Chair, good morning, members of the subcommittee. My name is Brandon Farstein. Uh, first of all, shout out to uh, both of these amazing women right here. Uh, would like to thank you for letting me present in front of you today. So obviously you can tell uh, me being 17, I am a little bit different than every other 17 year old. Uh, I'm the height of the average six and a half year old boy. So that obviously leaves me in a very unique perspective on the world. And I want to put you in my shoes for just a second. Imagine walking into school and being told by hundreds and hundreds of kids that if you don't kill yourself, they're going to kill you. Think about that. So, I'm not talking about me being a victim here. Because as you can already tell, I'm flipping this situation around 180 degrees, using it to help the thousands upon thousands of kids in Virginia that are victims to this, that need help, that need your help. So this bill leaves the family, leaves the victim with support, with the school to stand behind that. And that's what they need. We keep seeing in the news, we open the paper, how many more teen suicides do you need to see? Do I need to see? 
until we say enough is enough. And this is just one step that we can take forward to act in accordance to that, to have a proactive approach rather than reactive. Stop with the suicides. So we need to tell the schools, you need to do something right now. And this is, again, just one simple way to do that. So really, really hope that you all uh, are in, in favor of this bill. It would really save lives. And I know this seems like a very small grain of rice in a huge bowl. But trust me, one little step can mean all the difference. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. No, I'm looking at the language of the bill, and I'm um, seeing that, to me, it um, indicates that, first of all, a report has been made, and secondly, that there is probably going to have to be an investigation. What you are asking for is that the school report now to both parents what is the status now of this investigation? Because I know in my district there was an incident when where a student also was repeatedly told, you should kill yourself. And that student did. And that family did not hear about the status of the investigation. It was reported and reported and reported. And um, they always had to initiate the conversation can you tell me what's going on, what's happening? And so um, I don't think we're, we're asking anything new except for some type of communication in two weeks of the report that the parents are enlightened about just exactly what either what's been found or what's, what's going on. So I, I support the bill. Thank you. Anyone in the audience wish to speak to the bill? Confederation of Teachers. Sad to say, but uh, anti Semitic, anti Muslim, anti LGBT bullying is on the rise, and I'm very happy to see this bill before the committee. Um, I'm very grateful for Delegate Cole's suggestion. The really talented principals that I've known and had the privilege of working for in my 32 year uh, teaching career, and I think I could. Say that my colleagues would feel as well. Did exactly what uh, Delegate Cole. In fact, I can, I, I can envision one particularly strong uh, principal with red fingernails, clicking her fingers on the table when she had the two parents in the group trying to get some attention to this to this issue. So thank you, Delegate Cole, for making this a better bill. Um, and thank you, Delegate. Members of the subcommittee that year with Middle and High School principals, we take a bullying very seriously. 
seriously. We do not think this notification is onerous. My board has not seen the amendment, but I cannot see that there would be any opposition to it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? I'm going to interrupt my friend from Fairfax and uh, move to report this bill as amended. Second. It has been moved and seconded to report the bill as amended. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Those opposed, say the sign. Bill's reported. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Chairman you. and members of the subcommittee. Delegate Marshall. House Bill 1490. Mr. Chairman, this measure originated out of a situation in Prince William County in which a United States Navy commander who had been elected to the school board three times was notified in June uh, last year that he was to be deployed to Djibouti, Africa in support of Operation Enduring Freedom as a commander in the Navy. He, uh, he asked Delegate Anderson for an opinion for legislative services as to what he should do with respect to appointing a substitute to fill in for him when he is on deployment. Delegate Anderson asked legislative services and he received an answer which indicated one, that uh, Commander Trenum did have the option uh, if he wanted to have a replacement. Number two, that he had to specifically notify the school board of his intent to do this, not just that the school board could hear this in the community via the, the grapevine, but he had to notify them to do this before anything would be set in motion. And that three, he would return to his seat upon his redeployment and release from active duty. That position, the interpretation was based on Virginia Code 24.2-2281. Uh, he sought the names of individuals and submitted three, or was going to submit three. In the meantime, the chairman of the school board had decided to have a different interpretation of that uh, provision of the code. He additionally uh, got the consent of an individual who ran against me in 2015 and lost to be appointed to the school board. So he clearly was going to uh, try to appoint someone other than that which Commander Trenum was hoping to replace him. Uh, he, uh, the school board uh, requested an informal opinion from the Attorney General, and they concluded, uh, the Attorney General's office, that you didn't really have to listen to Commander Trent. Uh, subsequent to that, Senator Stewart sought a formal opinion, and they came back with the same conclusion. Right now, the Virginia Constitution makes accommodations for individuals who are in the military with respect to public service in the Commonwealth. For example, none of us as members of the House of Delegates could be employed as legislative assistants to members of Congress or work for the U.S. Department of Justice or transportation. Why? Because there's a prohibition against dual allegiances in the Code of Virginia. There's one exception to that. That is service in the United States military. That is not considered covered by the Constitution of Virginia as a forbidden loyalty. So, my statute simply wants to correct, and again, this was widely interpreted in Prince William as basically disrespecting the military. And people from all different backgrounds reach this conclusion, not just conservative Republicans. So my statute here is an attempt to state that if someone is deployed to active military and they're in the reserve, that they may identify an individual for replacement on a school board or submit a list of individuals to the school board and that the school board would either pick the first person if they only submitted one or pick from a list. So that's all this attempts to do because right now you've got the Attorney General going one way and legislative services going the other. Thank you, Governor. Marshall, questions for the paper? One of the 
audience wish to speak to the bill? <laughs> it's, a, it's a function of age, though, Nicole, I have, which I readily admit. I've battled with the School Boards Association and we're, we're all stand in opposition to the bill. I actually was standing in partial support because I think that Delegate Marsh was correct that the code is deficient when it comes to people calling up for, for active duty. The portion that we have concerns about has to do with how you fill that vacancy. Um, under Delegate Marshall's uh, bill, only in the case of school boards would the person that's called up get a right to, to designate who's going to replace him or her. Um, it wouldn't happen with city council, it wouldn't happen with the boards of supervisors, what have you. Uh, we have a concern about that. There is a provision in the code that's it, it, it's already there for how you fill vacancies, albeit in this case it would be a temporary vacancy uh, while the person is called to, to duty. Um, and we would respectfully that, that subdivision B, uh, subparagraph B, uh, not, uh, not be contained in the bill. Or, if that's a good policy, then it ought to be made applicable to your boards of supervisors, your city council, and the like. I, I see no reason to. I know it arose out of the school board in Prince William. I know that's what gave rise to the, the, the issue. But to be frank with you, I don't see any difference supervisors, you are voting on budgets. You can raise taxes. Uh, in Marshall versus MBTA, named after my suit, which I filed and won successfully over the Democratic governor, Republican attorney general, Republican speaker, said that you can't have tax base without representation. People cannot be appointed to raise taxes. So if you apply this to supervisors who have taxing powers, you would go against the 7 to 0 decision of the Virginia Supreme Court, since the only problem that I'm aware of, at least the one that came up, was one with the school board, I want to correct the problems that I'm aware of. And if there's other problems coming down the road, those delegates can correct those problems for their district. Anyone else wish to speak to the bill? Is there further discussion? Been moved and properly seconded to report the bill. All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. Those opposed, same sign. Bill's reported. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Delegate Greason. Bill 1660. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, thank you very much. Um, this bill uh, was brought to me at request. It is, um, I think, a very good bill. Hopefully you will think the same thing. There are two parts of this bill, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to bring to your attention. The, the bill actually is designed to create or try to accomplish two things. The first I'd like to separate them in your mind, if, if I could. The first one, uh, as you see in line 15, is to add the Federalist paper to a list of documents that I'll bring to your attention, shall be thoroughly explained and taught by teachers to students in public elementary, middle, and high schools. That last piece of the language is existing code. We shall do these things. We shall teach about the um, Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Uh, we shall teach the Statute of Religious Freedom and the Charters of the Virginia Company. All those things are existing code. I'm simply adding the Federalist Paper at request of um, a citizen to that list. So that's kind of part one of the bill. Part two of the bill um, is in like lines 24 through 27, where it says not only shall we um, teach these, we shall incorporate 
these concepts into the appropriate standards of learn learning pursuant to code section XYZ, the Department of Education shall report biennially to the House Committee on Education and the House Committee um, Education, or the Senate Committee on Education and Health, on how such documents have been incorporated into the appropriate standards of learning and into curriculum. So first part is, we already say you gotta teach all these documents and make sure the students understand that. Um, we're adding Federalist Papers, so that's part one. And part two is build it into the curriculum appropriately and then report on how well you've done that. Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions from you or the subcommittee. Thank you, Dr. Priest. Are there questions for the paper? Chairman? Delegate Rob. Um, I would ask the patron if he had considered including reference to the anti federalist papers. Mr. Chairman, Delegate Barack, I did not consider that until you sent me a text on that earlier this morning. <laughs> uh, I would say to the Chairman and Delegate Barack, in the spirit of Delegate Kilgore, get your own wheel. <laughs> But no, I had not considered it. <laughs> there are further questions for the paper. Um, <coughs> um, as a member of the um, Civics Education Committee, I thank you <coughs> for bringing forth this bill. I think that a study of the Federalist Papers would help um, students to understand the, how our government functions and how it was intended to function. So thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you, Delegate Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak to the bill? We operate on a motion. Second. It's been moved and properly seconded to report the bill. Any discussion from the subcommittee? And hearing none, all in favor, please raise your right hand. Opposed, same side. Bill reports. Thank you, Delegate Greasy. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Delegate Bolivar, House Bill 1552, and I apologize for your waiting. exciting things that I've gotten to be involved with on the Education Committee, and I think all would agree, is, is the recent focus on career and, and technical education. Um, I, I saw that while I was waiting today with some of the discussion. Um, it's certainly an integral part of the high school redesign uh, that the Board of Education is engaging in in our direction. Uh, Delegate Byron 